Hello, boys and girls. I hope you're having a good day. Glad to have this opportunity to spend a few minutes with you, a few packers. And we're going to start out, as we always do, with the books of the Bible. You know the Bible is the greatest book in the world. It's the greatest book known to man. It has told mankind through the centuries more things that are important about science, mathematics, everything. We want to know the books of the Bible. We want to know this book. Let's say the books of the Bible. Ready? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That was 39 books of the old. Now let's get to 27 of the new. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. All right, there's 27 books of the old. We say, I mean the new. Every time we say 39 in the old, 27 in the new, 27. What's 39 and 27? 66, 66, 66 books of the Bible. 39 old, 27 new, 66 books of the Bible. Be sure you learn them. We're going to find out later how many know them, and you'll be rewarded for that. Now, let's sing the song Zacchaeus, because I'm going to read you a story about Zacchaeus this morning. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Savior far to see. And when the Savior came along, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there, for I'm going to your house today. What did he do when he got to his house? He ate with him, he talked with him, and Zacchaeus became a follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? I want to read you a story about that. All right, boys and girls, the story about Zacchaeus is found in Luke chapter 19. The streets of Jericho were lined with people eager to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Among them was a tax collector. He also wanted to see Jesus. He was called Zacchaeus. Everyone hated tax collectors and believed that they were stole that they stole from them. And this man was hated too. And they felt like he put money in his pockets that was not really his. So no one would make way for him to get to see Jesus. And he's a short guy. He was short, and he was unable to see over the crowd. He was feeling very frustrated. Then he had a great idea. He would climb a tree, and from its branches he could see the procession that made its way toward him. He almost fell off the branch when Jesus stopped right below and said, Zacchaeus, come down from there. <laughs> I must stay at your house today. He scrambled down and bowed before Jesus as the crowd muttered angrily about Jesus visiting a sinner, a thief. But Zacchaeus was already a changed man. He said to Jesus, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. Hmm? And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay him back four times the amount. Maybe he wasn't a thief. And maybe he was honest. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, It is lost people like Zacchaeus whom I came to save. Today he has found salvation. Isn't that a great story, boys and girls? Why did Zacchaeus have to climb up in the sycamore tree? Two reasons. He was short. He wanted to see Jesus. But because he was short, he couldn't see over, and the people wouldn't let him by. But he still wanted to see Jesus, so he had to climb up the tree. What kind of tree was he climbed up in? A sycamore tree. And was he a changed man? Did he love Jesus? Yes, he did. He said, I'm going to give half of all of my goods to the poor. I'm going to be a good man. And if I have cheated anybody, I'll pay them back four times. Zacchaeus loved the Lord and obeyed him. 
Now then, let's do the five finger prayer and we're going to close with a song, Jesus Loves Me. You still saying your prayers? I hope you're doing better every day about your prayers. Who do we pray for? First of all, we pray for who? Those who are the closest to us, our family, our parents, brothers and sisters. Surely you're saying good prayers for your parents, for all the good things they do to you. They buy your clothes, your shoes. Hey, they help you with toys. They feed you, give you a bed to sleep in. They love you. Pray for your parents, those closest to you. Pray for those in authority. Who, who are the ones in authority? That's the president, the governor, the fire chief, the police chief. Pray for those people who have a lot of influence on our lives. That they would look to God and do God's will so that our lives may be blessed and be happy. Pray for the leaders. Who are the leaders of the church? I tell you every week. You need to write them a little note or a card and say hello to them and tell them you love them. Phil Sullivan, Jerry Cooper, and Tim Dickerson. They are ones that watch for the church, the souls of the church. Try to shepherd it. They need wisdom. You need to pray for them to have wisdom and good health. And after that, who do we pray for? Now we pray for them. Those closest to us, those in authority, our leaders, the weak. Who are the weak? Those are the people that are sick. Could be somebody in your family. We've had people that have been sick. Pray and ask God to bless them, help them to get well. Pray for the doctor that's treating them, that's performing surgery for them. Pray for the weak. And who is the last one, boys and girls? Always for me. That's you. Pray and ask God to bless you. Help you to be a good boy and a good girl. Help you to love your folks and live in the right way. I hope you're very good about your prayers now. When you go to bed at night, you pray. When you wake up in the morning, you pray. Before you eat your food, you pray. Before you do anything, you ask God to bless you. Let's close our pew packers by singing, Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my friend, Jesus is my friend, Jesus is the one who cares for me, yes me, what a happy song, singing all day long, Jesus is a friend to me. You have a good week, we hope to see you soon. I'd like to welcome you to the evening services of the Amory Church of Christ, and we hope that you've had a nice day, a good day, and we hope you'll have a very good week. Now, in the way of announcements, I would like to encourage you to be sure and take one of the bulletins, the church bulletin. Sister Jan Minch is doing such a beautiful job with our bulletin. I tell her just about every week. It is beautiful. We're putting good information in there. We're putting helpful information spiritually and physically, things that we need to know about the events that are taking place at church and about the sick. But please pick up the bulletin when you come to get your communion. We think that will be very helpful to you. Now this evening, our lesson tonight will be on some ways that will help us to study the Bible. Some important ways. And I hope this is going to be very beneficial to us. I hope we're studying the Bible more than just simply listening to the Sunday morning, Sunday night service and the Wednesday night Bible talk. I hope we're taking time to read the Bible and find out things there that we do not understand through a commentary or through further study in that way or some type of word study. I hope we're checking these things out so we can understand and know what God's Word says. It's so very important. And I would start by reminding us of what we read in Hosea 4 and verse 6. By inspiration, notice what Hosea says to the children of Israel. And what did happen to them? He says, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, God says, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. Notice, I will also forget thy children. Oh, isn't that sad? And that's what happened to the children of Israel. Uh, it's a very sad, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. They forgot God's way 
because they stopped listening to, they stopped reading his word. They stopped teaching their children. So the children wound up being rejected also by God. They didn't even know how to obey. Well, that happened to the children of Israel. And brethren, it can happen to us. It happened because they forgot God's word. What do we think is going to happen to us and to our children, the next generation, if we do not teach them things that God does not want them to do that he calls sin that will cause them to lose their soul or we do not teach them the things that God wants them to do that will bless their life and help them go to heaven. We have got to spend time studying God's word so we'll know how to obey him. Now the first thing I would mention that would be a great help to us in studying God's word is to study it periodically. Periodically means that we must study at a select time, a time that we've set aside to know what God's Word says. I hope you have a time every day in your home or every night where you're reading God's Word. And as you read it, you take your notebook and your pen or your pencil. And if there's a word you do not understand or if there's a phrase there you do not understand, you write that chapter and verse of that particular book down and then later you go or go then and find out what that meaneth. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 we read this. He's talking about the Berean people. Man they are praised in God's word. It's such a wonderful uh, praise they get. Paul says these were more noble the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word. How did the Bereans receive the word? They received it with all readiness of mind. Readiness of mind. They were listening. They were trying to know. They were trying to understand. And then when they heard something that they did not understand, what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That word daily is very important there, brethren. Many times if we don't go ahead and do something right then about anything in life, we can mess around and we can forget it. Don't you know? You've done it. I've done it. Well, when it comes to understanding God's Word, if we don't write it down right then, we can very easily forget it. If we don't go back then, we can very easily forget to do it. They searched the Scriptures. They were noble. Well, you know, this is a great compliment to these Christians. And... We can have this great compliment by we ourselves following the great example of the Berean brethren. So be sure that you have a set time to study God's Word. That you study it periodically. Now, we need to study God's Word purposefully. Do it on purpose. You've understood that word. Oh, when we were children, sometimes we did something and... If we did it on purpose and we weren't supposed to, we got into a lot of trouble about that. You might have been asked, did you do that on purpose? <laughs> did you say that on purpose? Well, that's the negative way. But we need to do this on purpose in the positive way. We need to be purposefully in our study of God's Word. Have a definite plan. Have a definite time. Have a definite place in our home where we study. But don't limit it only there to your home. We study when we're able to come in the congregation, in the building. I, as a minister, have learned to study in all kinds of places. I have studied in doctor's offices. I have studied in uh, hotel rooms. I have studied on the seaside. I have studied in all kinds of places. But we need to have a set place that we have purposely set aside to study God's Word. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that is not to be ashamed, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. If we do not study God's Word, we can't rightly divide it. 
Some people don't know the Old Testament from the New Testament. That's why there's so much problem today in the religious world. People try to follow things that are written for the law of Moses or written for the the law of the patriarchs today, that's not for us. We live under the Christian age. We don't live on the Mosaical age. And they don't know how to rightly divide it. They don't even know sometimes if this book is Zechariah in the Old Testament or the New Testament. They don't know that. Where do I find Thessalonians? They don't know it. We've got to study the Word of God so we can know what it means and how we should live. We need to study pensively. So what does the word pensively mean? It means that we must really think about what we're reading, what we are studying. We've got to really think about it. We've got to really think about God's Word. We've got to think deeply about it. We've got to meditate upon it, as the psalmist says, so it can become clear to us. How many things in life have you done this with? You have pensively studied something or thought about something. You know that after a while, sometimes things that you did not first understand, after giving a great deal of thought to it, you can understand it. And in this case, not only giving a great deal of thought, but a great deal of prayer, we understand it. Psalm 119 in verse 97. You know, Psalm 119, that's the great big chapter. Here we read this. The psalmist says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, is that true of us? Do we love the Word of God? Do we throughout the day think about the Word of God? Do we measure things that are taking place and things that we come into contact with, decisions that we make, do we measure all that by the Word of God? Because we have studied it, we've read it, we understand what it says to do, what it says not to do? I hope so. That's a great blessing. It's necessary for salvation. We should make this true of ourselves. Oh, I love it. And I love to meditate upon it during the day. Every time I see something, hear something, I think of the reference of that to the Word of God. God has placed that there for us for that purpose. We need to study the Word of God persistently. Well, we know what persistent is, especially if you have children. You know how persistent a two and three year old child is? They ask you something, if you don't answer them, they'll ask you again. And some of them, they'll just keep on asking, you know. They're persistent. And that's what it takes to finally get the attention and get what they want. We've got to be persistent in wanting to study the Word of God. We've got to be persistent in wanting to understand the Word of God. We've got to be persistent in knowing the Word of God. We've got to really think about it, brethren. Uh, we've got to really think about making time for this. And we've got to be persistent on and on throughout our life. Throughout our life in studying the Word of God. 1 Peter 2 verse 2 says it this way, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We understand that. A baby cries when it's hungry. It cries to be fed. It cries to be nursed. We've got to have that spiritual hunger. It would cause us to cry for the word of God. We want to hear it. We want to know it. We can grow through our study. And certainly we can be blessed by God through our study. We've got to be prayerful in our study. In this and in everything we do. James 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, I do. I need more wisdom. Do you? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask God for it. This is coming from the throne of God. That giveth to all men liberally. He gives it to us. And he'll give us plenty of wisdom. If we ask him for it. And he upbraids us not. He does not make fun. That word upbraid. See that's a word. Need to look it up. Well, what does upbraid mean? I, I, I don't think we use that word very much in our society today. If we upbraid someone. That means we make fun of them. Make fun of them because they don't know something. They don't understand something. 
But God upbraideth not, and it says he will give us wisdom. So we've got to be prayerful in our Bible study. Pray for understanding as we study and read the Word of God. And pray that we ask for divine help to learn and know His will. Pray for that. Divine help. He'll help us in different ways, more ways than we can understand or know. We need to study the Word of God properly. What does that mean? Correctly. You mean there's a proper way to study and there's an improper? Well, certainly there's a proper and improper way about everything. You know, there's a proper way to wear your clothes. Men, do you wear your trousers inside out? Be rough on using your pockets, wouldn't it? Ladies, would you think about wearing your clothes inside out? Do you wear your shoes on the wrong feet? You know, we try and try when children are little and they start learning how to put their shoes on and all to get the right shoe on the right foot and the left shoe on the left foot. There's a proper way to do everything. There's an improper way to do everything. Well, there's a proper way to study the Word of God. There is a correct way. There's a correct way, there's a correct way to understand God's Word. We've got to study it honestly. Remember 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman is not to be ashamed. A workman. A Christian. That needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We just do what it says. And we'll be alright. Just do it. Now let's consider as we come toward the end of this sermon. A few ways. Examples. Of some Bible study. In Genesis 45 and verse 6, we read this. Now, this is a statement that Joseph is making to his brothers after he has revealed himself to them in Egypt. He says, for these two years hath the famine been in the land. We've already had the famine for two years. And yet, there are five more years in which there's not going to be any erring, earring. E-A-R-I-N-G is the correct, correct way of pronouncing it. Earing, like an ear of corn, or harvest. Now, when I first read that, well, I, I can associate that with something about corn, something about food, but I honestly did not know what it meant. So I go and take a commentary. And what does the word earing mean? It's another word that we don't use for plowing. Joseph says there's not going to be any plowing to make the ground ready to sow seed. There's not going to be any rain. So this famine is going to continue. But you're not even going to be able to plow. There's going to be five more years that you can't even prepare the ground because of this great famine. Someone says, well, is that? Well, I think it's important to know it. I think it's important. I like to know things, uh, you know, knowledge is power. Ignorance, it's not bliss. Genesis 49 verse 10. Here we read the statement and the blessing that Jacob is making to his 12 sons before he dies. And this is the blessing that he is bestowing upon Judah, his son, his fourth son, Judah. Fourth son of Leah. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. He says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. What does that mean? Who is Shiloh? What does that mean between the feet? What does that mean about the scepter? What does it mean about the lawgiver? Again, I go and I take a commentary and I read about this. Jesus is Shiloh. He will come through the tribe of Judah. You can read this for yourself in Matthew chapter 1. Read down from the, about the descendants of, G, of uh, uh, Jacob. And you get down to Judah and see who comes after Judah. And you'll see that Joseph, he came from the tribe of Judah. David, who was told that the Savior would come through him, he's from the tribe of Judah. So, we see this in Matthew. We know that Jesus Christ is the great lawgiver. 
This did come through the descendants of Judah. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 24. And here this blessing is continuing about Judah that Jacob is bestowing upon him before he dies. So what does this blessing of Jacob mean that he gave to Judah? Genesis 49 verse 24. But his bow abode in strength. You're talking about bow and arrows. His bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence, from where is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. The tribe of Judah was a great tribe of great warriors. They did handle the bow very well. They were warriors of strength. They were blessed by God. And it's good to go back and read about the rest of the great blessing you see that Jacob made on Judah and his descendants. Who is the shepherd from whence the shepherd, the stone of Israel? Who is that? Well, we know, we learn from reading in the New Testament and going and checking further. We know that uh, Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the stone. Acts chapter 4 verse 11 talks about the fact that Jesus is the stone in this great sermon that Peter preached. He says, this is the stone. This is the rock which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Jesus Christ was the great stone that everything else must be built upon. He's the cornerstone. John chapter 10 verse 11. We understand that Jesus is the shepherd. He says there, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You see, we understand from reading other parts of the verses of the Bible. It explains itself. And also from reading from other biblical helps. Genesis 49 verse 25. Again, a blessing this time of Jacob on his son Joseph. And here's what we read. Even by the God of thy father, Joseph, my God, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, who shall help thee? And by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast, and blessings of the womb. Boy. Joseph, Jacob says, and Jacob blesses him, is going to be blessed by every way that a man could be blessed. He gets the blessings that make the foods grow, food grow. He gets the blessings of posterity, descendants. The women from his tribe are going to be fertile. And just how did this blessing play out. Well, later on, when you turn to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 1, I want us to notice three verses here. Numbers chapter 1, verse 33 and verse 35, and also Numbers chapter 1 and verse 27. In Numbers, we read about the first census of the fighting men of each tribe of the sons of Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. The first time they counted the men that were able to fight, this did not include the younger fellas, children, boy children. This did not include the older men who were beyond the age of fighting. Just the fighting men, this census is made. And I want you to notice the numbers of the children of Joseph, the fighting men. For those who were numbered, verse 33 says, of them, this is of Joseph's tribes. Joseph's sons got two tribes. There were so many descendants of Joseph that you've got Manasseh and Ephraim. And Ephraim, the second born, was the greater. But he says, those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Ephraim, were 40,500. Verse 35, those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Manasseh, were 30 and 2,200. When you add those numbers together, you're going to find out that there were more fighting men 
from the tribe of Jodah, Joseph, more descendants from Joseph than any of the other of the tribes. Numbers 1 verse 27 talks about the tribe of Judah, the great tribe of Judah. Even his tribe had less fighting men. Those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Judah, were three score and fourteen. There's seventy-four thousand and six hundred. But when you go back and count these numbers of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, it's more than, it's almost seventy-nine thousand. So you see how we can understand and study. Th these are important things. But they're important things that we can learn about salvation too. From the prophecies of the Old Testament as well as from reading the New Testament. Now these were the meanings of Jacob's blessings on Joseph. In Genesis 49 verse 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons. He gathered up his feet into the bed. He yielded up the ghost. He died. And listen to the last statement. This is one I want us to pay the closest attention to. And he was gathered to his people. What is so great? What is so significant about that statement? He was gathered to his people. You realize that this phrase, gathered to his people, is talking about the place of the soul. It's talking about the existence of the soul separate and apart from the body. There is such a place. It's talking about the next world. So, it's talking about immortality. Here is teaching from God's word about life after death. About immortality. About eternity. We understand things by the study of God's word. And that's the way God intended it. Bible study is a spiritual feast. It's spiritual food. It is life to us as God's children. I hope that we will faithfully study God's word. That we will faithfully read it. And I hope that we will do this with our children. And I certainly hope that we will truly Enjoy, you got me brethren, enjoy the reading and the study of God's word to know and understand his will for us and the great help and his blessing upon us through this to go to heaven. I hope this sermon has been pleasing to God and that it will be helpful to all of us. If we can help you in any way to become Christians by repentance of your sins, confession of Christ's name and him as a son of God. And through the watery baptism to contact the blood of Christ to cleanse your soul. To be added to the Lord's kingdom to the church. And your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Please call us. It's the greatest thing you'll ever do. It's the thing you most want to do whether you understand it now or not. It's the thing to do to be ready to meet Jesus. If we need the prayers of the church in any way, any of us who are members, please call upon us. And I hope you have a very good week. Thank you.